if you let Jesus use you, you will catapult into phenomenal value. Come on, tell your neighbor, if you let Jesus use you, you will have more value than you ever dreamed. He never takes. He always borrows. And he pays us back with tremendous dividends. He that give it to the poor, lend it unto the Lord. Don't you want God to use you? Aren't you glad that God will use what you have and then give you much more in return? Hello, Bezel T3. That was Charles Blake, residing bishop of the Church of God in Christ, a six million member Pentecostal holiness denomination, and he's also senior pastor of West Angeles Church of God in Christ, boasting over 25,000 members and a very mod-looking plexiglass pulpit. Their statement of faith is mostly orthodox, other than the belief in a mandatory second baptism of the Holy Spirit, the ability through that baptism to live a holy and apparently sin-free life, and the curious addition of feet washing along with the normal sacraments of water baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, in comparison to guys like T.D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, and Creflo Dollar, Charles Blake's net worth is chicken feed. However, he has managed to eke out a very comfortable lifestyle in a modest Beverly Hills manse he and his wife purchased in 2002 for $4 million and is now selling for $11 million. But what caught my interest in Charles is the fact that, apparently, his preaching is so powerful, so insightful, that he feels it's worth paying for. That's right, folks. While most pastors' sermons are free to listen or watch on their church's website, at West Angeles Church of God in Christ, it's God, G-O-D, Gospel on Demand. Ready to get God now? This is the day. Bishop Charles E. Blake in the West Angeles Church of God in Christ presents Gospel on Demand. One, two, three, praise it! Over 300 high-quality sermons from Bishop Blake and several special guests available to you on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. So I'm thinking his sermons must be really, really good if people are willing to pay for them. So I got a hold of one for us to look at and see just what's up with that. Now, Charles is preaching from Luke 19, verses 30 through 40. It's Luke's account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The first 13 minutes or so were actually decent, with Charles reading from the text and giving some contextual details and a few quippy applications. He talks about Jesus' special knowledge and kingly authority concerning the whereabouts and the requisition of the colt of a donkey of which he has need. So we'll pick it up around the 13-minute mark. This was a steed, a donkey, that nobody had ever ridden on before. But Jesus can bring things under control. You might be in an out of control situation. Things may be crazy in your home, on your job, in your setting. But bring Jesus into your setting and he can bring things under control. Now is that the promise we see in scripture that when things get crazy, Jesus will bring things under control? Well, perhaps sometimes he will, but sometimes it's a far different story. Sometimes things are crazy and seem to get more crazy, and yet the Christian can have inner peace knowing that God will work all things, even crazy and bad things, for their ultimate good. Remember James in chapter 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance or steadfastness. And let this steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, meaning mature, lacking in nothing. Now, from here on out, he's pretty much going to ignore the rest of the passage and center on verse 37 and the praise that the people were giving Jesus as he begins to enter the city. See what God has in store for you with Gospel On Demand. They praised him. I said they praised him. It was speedy praise. Not only was it unanimous, it was multitudinous. Now, one more time, multitudinous. Jesus was a valid Messiah. Look in Zechariah 9 and 9. Now, I give Charles props for using this well-known messianic passage from Zechariah 9. You know it. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. 
But there is so much more in this passage he is preaching from that can be further explained by using other Old Testament passages and the other gospel accounts of this story. For instance, Jesus intentionally planned his route to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. In verse 29 of Luke 19, this passage we're looking at, when he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples. Now this is important. It's another way in which Jesus is designating himself as the Jewish Messiah. You see, Ezekiel 11.23 has to do with the return of God's people to Jerusalem. Here it is. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. Now that mountain is the Mount of Olives. It's the same mountain we read of in Zechariah 14.4, which reads, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. Now keep in mind that this is happening just days before the Jewish Passover celebration. It was joyful praise. I said it was joyful praise. They started to rejoice. And child of God, if you believe in Jesus, you ought to be a joyful believer. With the gold package, you can enjoy full access to every video on demand yearly. The people were praising Jesus, and we as believers should be joyful indeed. But what else is so striking about this passage? Well, look at verse 29. When he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet. Bethany, as most of you know, is where Jesus raised his good friend Lazarus from the dead. Now, if we go to John chapter 12, we read this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Word of Jesus' miracles was getting around the local area, and especially the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. So the chief priests, who also got wind of these miracles, were asking themselves, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. You see, they couldn't deny the miracles that Jesus was performing. Then we're told Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, well, he said, it's better for you that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Not knowing that he was actually prophesying that Jesus would die for the nation and not only for that nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And then we are told that from that day on they made plans to put Jesus to death. Now going to verse 9 of John 12, we read this. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to even put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. That's crazy, wanting to put Lazarus to death. And yet, Jesus, knowing all this, continues to set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. It was demonstrative praise. I said it was demonstrative. Demonstrative pronouns. This dog is big. That dog is small. They didn't just speak with their lips. They demonstrated it. They waved palm branches. They threw their clothes in his pathway. They screamed and they yelled. They cried and they rejoiced. It was reasonable praise. Tell your neighbor it's reasonable. I said it was appropriate praise. Bless the Lord. Jesus was the subject. God was the object. Subject and object pronouns. He is talking to them. When you praise him, the Lord shows up. When you praise him, the Lord shows out. When you praise him, bodies are healed. When you praise him, yokes are broken. When you praise him, miracles take praise. Come on and praise. Well, so much for Job's words, even though he slay me, I will put my hope in him. Our relationship with God in Christ is not a quid pro quo type arrangement. Quid pro quo, I tell you things, you tell me things. 
Christians are citizens of the kingdom of God and all because of God's grace. He owes us nothing. We don't leverage God's favor by whipping ourselves up into a whirling dervish-like state of unrestrained praise as a means of getting earthly blessings. Christians are God's servants and sometimes we will have to endure crazy situations and even suffer for him. And even then, we are to love and praise him. Remember, 2 Timothy 13, 12 tells us, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Glory! Come on, come on, come on! Praise him! We praise the name Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. You've been good to us, Lord. Does anybody have something that you need God to do in your life? Something you need from God? Something you're longing for? You want God to perform that miracle in your life? Now, what faith does? How many of you believe God? I mean, really believe Him. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask. I think you may even think. Faith acts like it's already done. Yes, Faith praises God. Yes, if you want to be healed, you're praising God. Thank you for healing me. Or reap the blessings of the silver package and stream any sermon that you want monthly. has already received their miracle. Somebody has already been delivered. Check your body. Check your body. Check your feelings. Who is that who's received that miracle? The pain is gone. It's just that simple. And if you prefer to download one sermon at a time, the bronze package is just for you. That's yearly, monthly, and individual video subscriptions all available for your convenience. You'll be pleased when you get what God has in store for you. But wait, get Gospel On Demand now and get one free video download with your purchase. God is leading you somewhere. Watch uplifting messages everywhere you go with Gospel On Demand. Start your subscription today on westday.tv. Someone needs to accept the Lord as your Savior. Someone needs their sins forgiven. Someone. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord and you want to be saved, you want Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, I'll pray for you right where you are. But I need to know that you desire prayer. If that's you, lift that hand now and say, Preacher, pray for me. I want to be saved. Charles then begins an evangelistic appeal, an altar call, if you will. But don't miss my point. Everyone in that auditorium, Christian or non-Christian, needs their sins forgiven. And hopefully, West Angeles Church of God in Christ has a liturgy that includes a corporate confession of sin and a declaration of God's pardon for those believing in Jesus Christ as part of its regular worship service. Every true Christian church should have a time of corporate confession of sin and then hearing the words that assure us that those things we thought or spoke or did with our hands last week that were contrary to God's law cannot and will not condemn us. The reason this is so important is that one week is just long enough to forget that you're a Christian at all. And if you doubt this, just take a good, hard look at your past week. Was everything you, you thought or spoke or did well-pleasing to God? I know my thoughts and actions weren't. So as we end this look at a church that charges to hear sermons that may or may not be all that good, and as we examine our lives this past week, if you are like me, you may want to pray this prayer of confession. Oh, Savior, help me. I am slow to learn, prone to forget, and weak to climb. I am in the foothills when I should be on the heights. I am pained by my graceless heart, my prayerless days, my poverty of love, my sloth in the heavenly race, my sullied conscience, my wasted hours, my unspent opportunities. 
I am blind while the light shines all around me. Take the scales from my eyes, grind to dust my heart of unbelief. Make it my highest joy to study you, meditate on you, gaze on you. Sit like Mary at your feet, lean like John on your breast, appeal like Peter to your love, count like Paul all things but dung. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. You see, and then after that heartfelt, silent, but corporate confession of sin in the worship service, we hear the words from the pastor, the sweet words of the assurance of salvation, the assurance of pardon. That is, if you're trusting in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, know you are cleansed from all guilt before God. And I'll leave you with this quote from Kevin DeYoung I found so helpful. The cleansing, mind you, is not like the expunging of a guilty record before the judge. That's already been accomplished in and through Christ Jesus. This cleansing that happens weekly with the corporate confession of sin, the assurance of pardon, this cleansing is more like the scraping of barnacles off the hull of a ship so it can move freely again. We need confession of sin before God like a child needs to own up to his or her mistakes before his mother or father. Not to earn God's love, but to rest in it and know it more fully. You see, if this is not part of your regular worship service, then ask your pastor respectfully and sincerely, why is it not?